Well, guys, I just, uh, you guys can have a seat. I just uh, real quick want to give just a huge shout out to the worship team for just uh, coming up and just really getting our hearts ready for the Word of God. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Let's give a big round. Come on. Let's give some praise to them in the Lord. Amen? Well, guys, I am obviously not ske- Scott Clevenger, um, and unfortunately, like I said a few weeks ago, you do have to listen to me this week. Um, I'm so sorry that you have to deal with that. Um, but I want to say good morning, Gulf Coast. I hope you're doing well. If this is your first time here, I want to say welcome. I want to say thank you for joining us. Um, and if it's your first time joining us online, I want to say thank you if you're just joining us. If it's your second time here, I want to say thank you for coming back. Hopefully we didn't mess it up the first time. <laughs> Um, I want to thank you just seriously so much for coming in. Guys, if you missed it, yesterday we had an amazing, amazing day with IDES. We packed over 51 thousand eight hundred and forty meals that are going to be going to Haiti and Afghanistan. Let's give the Lord some praise. Come on. Isn't he good? Amen. Now, guys, if you did miss it, I want you to see some of the awesome things that were taking place. We've got... Um, Buddy, Buddy decided he was going to take my phone and have some fun, so I figured I'd have some fun with him. Buddy's right here if anybody wants to just give him a high five later. Um, we got right here is where we're loading the rice and everything like that, a full functioning team just kind of going together. Then um, Josh decided he was, and Josh is right back there if we want to give him a shout out for, you know, doing everything. And because I put them in there, I figured I had to put me in there because um, I figured that was the only sweet thing to do. Um, But guys, yesterday we had over a hundred volunteers come out. We had Trinitas School come in, their soccer team came in, and we're playing. And I want you guys to see this picture right here. You see the one, two, three, four, five pallets. All of those were packed in a little over three hours. Three hours, guys. 51,000 meals went out. And we found out when we hit 30,000, and this is really cool to me, when we hit 30,000, we were a part, and you were a part, as Gulf Coast Christian Church, of helping IDES reach one million meals made this year. Can we just give the Lord some praise? How awesome is he? Amen. Man, God is good. So I, I also want to give you guys some info. If, if you are not plugged into a small group yet, I, I really, really want to just encourage you to get plugged in. We have small groups meeting all over Pensacola. We have a men's group. We have a women's group. We have a Pensacola, Northwest Pensacola group. We have a Pace group. We have groups meeting all over Pensacola, and they're just a really great way to get plugged in. I also want to let you know we have had a little bit of COVID stuff kind of going through Gulf Coast. Scott Clevenger actually is homesick right now. Uh, Amanda tested positive. He has not tested positive. Um, But we do have a little bit going through, so make sure we're washing hands. Make sure we're doing our best to just keep everybody safe and respect for everyone. Um, We are actually going to be learning about contentment today. Um, and if, if you have your Bible with me, or with you, if you would go ahead and turn in God's Word to Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. And, and do you guys mind, go ahead and let's stand for the reading of God's Word. In Philippians, it says this, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you've revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned to, in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret to facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Let's come to the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, you, you know my heart. You know that I, I truly desire to, to step up here and just completely uh, let your words speak out. And Lord, I believe that the people that have walked through these doors have come in here not wanting to hear Andrew talk or Scott talk or, or anything. They want to hear you talk. They want to hear you talk to their hearts. So Lord, I want to start out by just asking that you would open our hearts. Open our hearts so that we would hear exactly what you want us to hear today. Lord, I lift up our pastor who, who is, is under the weather and not feeling well. And Lord, I just pray that you'd protect him, keep him safe, protect our body, keep our body safe. Lord, and, and I genuinely just truly pray that for the one that's in this room that may not know you, that they would hear that you love them. Lord, we love you so much. This we pray in your name. 
Amen. Now, guys, um, not long ago, I heard a statement um, about contentment, and, and I, think it's, I think it's kind of funny. It was actually from a comedian, um, and, and he said it this way. He said, content or discontent, which tent do you live in? <laughs> I actually asked them if they would bring like a, a laugh sign and just like walk it through, but uh, there we go. There we go. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you, Terry. Um, but, but truly, there's a lot to unpack there. Content or discontent? Which tent do you live in? Where are you making camp? Are you making camp in contentment? Or are you making camp in discontentment? Because it's a choice. It's, it's not just something that we, we trip over, we fall into. It's a choice that we have to make. I remember when I first moved out of um, my home, I went to start working. And you start working, you start, you know, bills start coming. And let me promise you, keto helped me lose a little bit of weight. But boy, I tell you what, I was skinny. When, when I first moved out of my house, because I tell you, it was ramen, and it was them big sandwiches from Walmart, because they were cheap. And, and I was real, real skinny, not because I wanted to be, but because I couldn't be fat. I, I couldn't afford it. But I, I had moved from job to job to job to job to job, because I fell into a lie. And the lie was, the grass is always greener on the other side, right? Everybody sitting here thinks, it's, it's so much easier over there. Like, their life is so much better than mine. But really, you have no clue what's going on in their life. You have no clue what's on the other side. There could be there could be ants, bugs. Let me promise you, Shannon partially does uh, yard stuff, and some of the things that I found out that can be with grass, like I really don't want to mess with it. (laughs) The grass is not always greener, even green grass. So we fell into this lie that the grass is always greener. And and, in the first year, I literally had seven W twos. First year, I had seven W twos that I just went from job to job to job to job. Because if anything went wrong, I just jumped ship. I just moved on. And I feel like sometimes in life, we get to this spot where we, we run to ocean water, wanting it to quench our thirst, but really all it does is make us more thirsty. We think that if we could run and just get as much water as we can, that it's going to do something for me. But let me promise you, if you're not tapped into the right kind of water, all that's going to happen is it's actually going to kill you. You see, if we keep looking to water that was never meant to nourish us for nourishment, all that's going to happen is it'll kill us. That's what happens. If you keep drinking salt water, you'll literally die because it was never meant to hydrate you. It was never what it was meant for. So I, I want to start by asking this. Do you want to be content? Is that what you want in life? If, if you're not wanting to be content, I really appreciate you coming in. Um, I hope you enjoyed worship but this probably isn't going to mean a whole lot for you. If you want to know what contentment is, stick around, because there's something amazing about it. And if you're looking, and you know in your heart right now you're not content, hang on, because the Spirit of God is going to come in, and He's ready to give you contentment in your life. Amen? I think all of us have been in situations where we would say, I don't like it. We've been in jobs that we didn't like and been in situations that we didn't like. We, we either we didn't like our job or we didn't like the fact that we didn't have a job. We didn't like the amount of money we made or didn't make. We didn't like several situations we've been in. Ha- who can raise their hand and say the holidays didn't shape up the way they thought they were going to be because they, they couldn't go home to see family? Who's ever been in that situation? Who's ever been in a situation where all the family came in and you were like, oh, man. <laughs> go home. <laughs> go home. <laughs> it's not what you thought it was going to be. Just go home, please. <laughs> like, have a good one. Merry Christmas. <laughs> so guys, I, I want to I make a statement to you. When I preached last time, I brought a phrase to you guys, and I don't know who remembers it, but it's this right here. I want us to get hot. And that doesn't mean hot like I get up here on stage. Like temperature-wise, I want us to get hot, meaning I want us to be humble, open, and transparent. I want us to be humble enough to say, hey, there are areas in my life that I may be discontent. I want us to be open enough to go, hey, I need help. And I want us to be transparent enough to realize that's me. That's me. And we have to be that way with ourselves. I, I know, I, I bring all this up because I know there are times that we're listening to a message and you, you leave on Sunday and you go, Whoa! pastor was on fire today. Man, I don't know who he's talking to, but it was good. That was good stuff. Couldn't be me. 
couldn't be me. Man, as for Jenny, man, I'm going I'm you know, to send her the Facebook link for that because she, she need to be hearing some contentment. That's what she need to be hearing. Can we just pause for just a second? Anybody that you're thinking could use this message, could you just stop for just a moment and go, hey, I might need this message today? Don't be thinking about who could need it, but be thinking about you. Where am I at in my life? Where do I sit with this? Well, guys, we're actually, it, it's very interesting to me the way that um, Philippians starts and, and is, is, because Philippians really does talk a lot about joy, and, and, and Philippians actually mentions joy more times in Philippians than any other letter in the New Testament. It mentions it more in Philippians. And it, it, the reason it's fascinating to me is Paul's in prison, guys. Like, and, and he's not in, like, you know, the, the fun prison, which, I, I mean, if there is a fun prison. I've heard Europe's prisons are actually fairly nice. Um, but it's not like a fun prison. It's, it's, you know, you're shackled to a brick wall. There's no AC. There's no nothing. You're, you're pretty much just miserable. And what's interesting to me is he, he literally ends this message, and he goes, hey, I'm, I'm good. I'm content. I'm happy. Like, how is it that you're sitting in prison and you're happy? Like, hold on, Paul, that doesn't make sense. How can you be content just sitting there horribly? See, contentment is hard to find in our culture today. You look around, when, when we're in one season, we wish to be in another. When it's hot, we want it to be cold. It's just we can't seem to make up our mind. Uh, like I said before, when it's Christmas time and family comes in, it's all fun and games, and then you're like, hey, family, go home. You know, it's, it's just not, it, we, we just can't seem to be happy. But Paul is saying, I'm happy. Well, when he writes Philippians, you start to read this letter, and you find out that it's actually a thank you note. Paul is literally thanking the Philippians for ministering to him financially. And they, they supported him, kind of like how we support different missionaries and everything like that. And, and he's writing to them, and he's just saying, thank you. But you see, Paul also brought them to Christ. So Paul's also kind of a mentor to them. He kind of built them up. He he's established the church with them. So he's also trying to teach them a little bit with this. So he's, he's, he's not just trying to, hey, thank you for the money. He also wants to teach them about money. And he wants to teach them about what contentment can actually mean. Not just money, but what contentment can actually bring with our finances, with everything. So it's interesting to me, he, he literally, I don't know if you caught this in the text, but he literally goes, hey, thank you so much. I appreciate you so much. But I'm good. I'm good. Like, I'm, I'm really okay. I, I, I didn't necessarily need it. And it's not that he was sitting in prison and he was all sad and mad and couldn't just get happy. And then the money came and he was like, oh boy, the money's here. Like, that's, that's not what happened. He's really wanting them to know, like, hey, I, I'm, I'm content. I'm, I'm okay. And he's not, he, he, he sits there and he says, I'm content no matter what situation, in any situation, I've learned to be content. And he's not saying, I've learned that I'm supposed to be content. He's saying, <clears throat> I've learned to be content. Whether I have a lot of money or no money, whether I have abundance or whether I'm in need. And, and you know, Paul, Paul's not the guy that, you know, is sitting there going, hey guys, I, I know what it's like to have millions of dollars, but he's homeless and he's never had a dime in his life. See, Paul actually came from privilege. Paul was like the Pharisees of Pharisees. Paul had it made. And then God calls him. He's been shipwrecked. He's been homeless. He's been in jail more times than he can count. He has lived on both sides. He's lived in abundance, and he's lived in misery. He, he's lived in both situations, guys. And he's sitting here, and he's saying, I'm content. You know, everybody wants contentment. Everybody wants all these different things. The Stoics wanted it. The Stoics sat there and said that if I could just stay calm and everything would be okay, I can do that. The Buddhist, it's like the top of their thing is if you can find true contentment. And it's hilarious to me because Paul's sitting on the, the wet, cold ground going, I got that in spades, guys. I got that. Everybody's seeking for it. Everybody's searching for it. And he's just sitting there going, I'm good. I'm great. Hands tied up not being able to do anything, I'm good. I'm okay. When was the last time you can remember being tied down by something and going, I'm good. I'm okay. It doesn't bother me. No. Um, see, she, she couldn't even think of a time. When was the last time that you can remember just being that okay with things, right? So, 
Um, uh, let, <laughs> I was trying to decide whether or not I was going to say this, but I'm going to go ahead and do it for the fun of it. Um, so I, I want to sidebar a little bit. Um, <laughs> um, can y'all say this for me? Can y'all just say, I'm good? All right. I'm good. I want you to look at the person around you, and I want you to literally look at them and go, hey, I'm good. One more time. Everybody look at each other. I'm good. Okay. Now, now this is for my high schoolers, my college students, my single, my married, old, wherever you are at in life, I, I, I need you to know this. When you look to that person next to you, I need you to look at them and you go, hey, I can't find my contentment in you. I'm good. I've got to find it in Christ. The person sitting next to you, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, no matter who it is, you can't find your contentment in it. Your sister, your mom, your dad, your pastor, you can't find contentment in them. Like, that's just not how it works. So, and, and, and let me just break this down. Ladies, no guy wants to marry Barbie. <clears throat> we don't. Like, that's not what we're wanting to do. Um, we don't want a girl that's sitting there going, if I don't have the nicest car, if I don't have the nicest house, if all this stuff isn't perfect, uh-uh. You better go at somebody else. Like, guys don't want that. We want a girl that wants all of those things, but is okay if she doesn't have them. Because her contentment is found in Jesus Christ. And, and guys, <laughs> girls don't want a guy that when anything goes wrong, it completely wrecks their day. Like, oh, my coffee's cold. Oh, my day's ruined. Like, nobody wants that. Like, no girl, like, the girls are going, all right, like, <laughs> you have a good day because I, I don't really want to be around you. <laughs> So we, we, we sit there and we, we come to this place where we want to be around people that have a calm. Like, have you ever noticed that? That you get around certain people that the drama is just like here, and you're like, man, it's kind of miserable to be around you. Like, wow, thank you for bringing all of us down. Like, I was up here, and then you told me about all your woes, and now I'm down here. Like, thank you so much for coming over today. Like, Wow. So, so we, 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 we want to be around people who are content. And the thing that I find interesting is Paul's natural disposition wasn't contentment. That's not, that's not the way he was naturally. It was his decision. Paul made a decision. I have, I, he says, I've learned to be content. It's, it's not that, you know, he was just chilling and it's, you know, hey, he's from California. He's a real chill dude, man. no. Like, no, he had to learn it. You know, any time I think of, like, a real chill dude, I really do think of Ed Moore, especially because he just made a comment and I heard him. Um, because, like, Ed will just walk in and be like, yo, dude, what's up? How you doing? But that's, that's Ed. That's Ed. Now, I can promise this. His kids and his wife will probably go, hey, he's not always just calm and dandy. That's not his natural disposition. <laughs> it's a decision that he makes to come in and go, hey, I want to be upbeat. Hey, I want to come in, and I want to make people smile. I want to come in, and I want to be content and happy with where I'm at. Now, we're going to ask ourselves three questions today. We're going to ask, what is true contentment? We're going to ask, how do we get contentment? And we're going to ask, where does contentment come from? Now, to look at what true contentment is, there's a book called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. I really, really suggest it. If you have not had a chance to read it, it's really good. Um, the Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. It's by an author, Jeremiah Burroughs. It's absolutely ama amazing. Get the updated version. It was originally written in the 1600s, um, and it's a little old school in the language. Get the updated version. Trust me, it's better. Um, and, and he has a definition that I just think is absolutely amazing for contentment. He says, Christian contentment is an inward and peaceful frame of spirit. Like, like, think about that, guys. Christian contentment is an inward and peaceful frame of spirit. So it's an inward peace. That means it's not rooted in our circumstances. It's in our heart. It's not what's happening out there. The mountains can crumble into the sea, but we're okay. I can be miserable. I can hate my life, but things can be okay. Can, can I, like, like, we're being hot. Remember, we're being humble, open, and transparent. Can I just show of hands of who's ever been like, I just really hate where my life's at right now. I just really don't like where I'm at right now. I don't like the situation I'm in. I don't like where my finances are at. I am miserable. I hate my life. 
Like, we've, we've all been there. We have all been in those situations. So, so how do we get to contentment? How do we get to this different place? Jeremiah Burroughs says, but um, he has stability. That's an inward, it transcends my circumstances. Now, in, in, in saying all of that different stuff, I, I want you to hear something. I, I love the way he says it as it's written in the 1600s. It's still so true today. Let's see if it sounds like any of your family um, or possibly you. He says this, Some people are so weak that they cannot restrain from the unrest of their spirits. But in words and behavior, they reveal what is woeful disturbances are within. Their spirits are like the raging sea, casting forth nothing but mire and dirt and troublesome, not only to themselves, but also to all with whom they live. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. You know that there's, there's that person or there's that situation. You may be, if you can't think of anybody, you might be the person. I'm just throwing that out there to you. Um, if you can't think of anybody, you may be that friend. Um, that that is, is living right here, that you come and just my iron dirt gets kind of stirred up. And, and that's okay because we, we, we need to vent. We need to talk to different people. But we, we, we also have to come back to where contentment is. And some of you may have heard that and go, how does he know my family? Um, and, and there are people that say whenever something doesn't make them happy, the world is going to know it. And that's, you know, in Facebook or, you know, in your Facebook, um, there are waves churning up dirt. Ha- has anybody ever been in that situation where the only time someone gets on Facebook is to throw something in your face? You know? I just, oh, if I could get rid of Facebook. Whew. Um, so, but, but there's also this other side. There's this other side of it. Because some people are super quiet, right? So this is what he says about the other side. He says, others are able to restrain such disorders of heart. You can keep your mouth shut. I am not one of these. But even so, they boil inwardly and eat away like a canker. These people, while there is a serene calm upon their tongues, have a blistering storms upon their spirits. And while they keep silent in their heart, They are troubled, even worn away with anguish and worry. They have peace and quiet outwardly, but within war from an unruly and turbulent workings of their heart. It it makes me think of a shoe. You know, if if you guys have no clue what my feet are going through in these shoes right now, um, I get made fun of because I'm not exactly the most hip worship pastor. I'm not like the skinny jean dude and the, you know, the, I do have the cool socks, but anyways, um, I, I'm not the, the most hit person, but my, my favorite thing is m- when Melissa gets like, you know, the girls, when you get the new pair of heels, you know, and you got to break them in. On the outside, you look fine. Like it looks fine. You may be walking a little, little weird, but you look fine. But on the inside, the flesh is getting pinched. You're in pain. You are breaking down. Everything on the outside seems fine. But on the inside, you're miserable. You look to God and you say, why? Why me? I hate my life. Guys, that's not contentment. God doesn't want you to be so nagging and complaining about everything, but the goal is not keep your mouth shut and inside your heart's it's raging. That's not the wind today. The change is in your heart. It's inward. It's an inward peace, guys. It's not outside. I'm telling you, some of the most miserable people in the world are comedians. They make everybody laugh. Everything's funny. I watched an interview of Kevin Hart. I don't know if any of you guys know them. That's right, your pastor is a sinner. He has watched Kevin Hart before. Did it, watched an interview with him. Dude broke down. He's in the middle of going through divorce. He said, my life is horrible, but my job is to make people smile. On the outside, Kevin Hart looks like he's having a great life. He's a funny dude. Hangs out with Shaq. Funny dude. On the inside, he wishes he could be anybody else. If I remember correctly, I want to say Kevin Hart has been through two to three marriages. He's not living a great life, guys. He, he truly is wrestling. But on the outside, we would all go, Kevin Hart, having a great life. Now, for the, la- the sake of clarity, I want to say a few things. Let me say what contentment is not opposed to. 
When I say it's a peaceful and inward spirit, that doesn't mean you're ignorant to your afflictions. Some people think that that's what the Bible's saying. Like, I pretend like my problems aren't problems. Like, man, I am so sorry that you're in a full body cast. No, I'm good. I'm good. Praise God. Praise God. No, I'm good. I'm good. No. Like, no, that's not what Scripture is saying. Like, man, I'm so sorry your mom passed away. No, you know, no good. God's good. All the time. God's good. Praise the Lord. No. Like, Scripture's not saying you don't call crosses crosses. There's still crosses. But we're commanded to pick up our crosses, right? Amen? Like, we're commanded to pick up our cross and follow God. It's not that we don't have crosses. It's that our responsibility is just to pick them up. And it's not because we're necessarily picking up our cross, because, you see, Jesus says this awesome statement. He says, you throw on me your problems, and you take up me. I got you. Scripture is not telling us we have to sit back and just be quiet. Peace does not acquire ignorance. It doesn't mean we're ignorant to our afflictions, and it doesn't mean that you can't voice your struggles to God, to a friend. A person can say to God, I'm dealing with this thing. I don't like it. I want it to go away. Can I just be real with you guys? I, I, I feel like sometimes we as believers just can't do that. One of the most freeing things that I've seen in the past couple months was someone coming up to me and just going, hey, I really don't like life. I'm not okay with it. The freedom, the humbleness, the openness, and the transparentness that this person had to come up and go, I'm not happy. Let's be real, believers. It's okay. We can look to our dad and go, I don't like this. Let's be real. Because our God, our Heavenly Father, he's not sitting there looking down at you and going, well, you don't like it? Well, I don't like you. No, that's not what he's saying. He's sitting there going, I got you. I got your back. I can take care of this. I, I feel like I, I grew up in a church, um, <laughs> and it's going to sound, I, I've shared with some people kind of the church that I grew up in, it's going to sound like, I, I'm, I'm being sarcastic when I say this, but I promise I'm not, um, of that y you would have a person there that like broke their leg, and they'd be like, oh, Jesus, thank you. Broken legs are the best. And I'm going, oh, pretty sure walking's pretty cool. Like, broken legs aren't necessarily the best. I mean, I understand, you know, you get to sit for a while. But if you're anything like me, you just get really bored, and your wife kicks you out of the house anyways. So... Um, it's just straight up junk. It's straight from Satan that you're supposed to, like, that when situations come up and everything like that, you're just supposed to be like, ooh, ooh, God's good, broke my leg. Holler, Instagram fic. Ah! No, that's not, that's not what that's supposed to be. That's not how that's supposed to go. So what is contentment against? It's against complaining. It's against freaking out with worry. It's against sinking into discouragement looking to some unhealthy behaviors to get relief, looking to alcohol. I mean, I'm not, your pastor is not sitting up here from the stage going, sinners drink. No. But looking to anything for relief outside of Jesus Christ, that is. Anything. It could be work. For me, I'm, your, your pastor is just being real with you. There are moments that literally Ashley, our campus coordinator, looks at me and goes, hey, you need to go home. Go home. Because I find contentment in my fulfillment in what I do. I'd say a lot of men actually wrestle with that. But guys, we have to remember that we, we can be content. It's not, contentment is not okay with lashing out in anger. It's against casting off Christian duty. Some people, when they run into certain situations that are hard, they look up to God and go, God made this situation hard, so I'm just not going to talk with God no more. And God's probably sitting up there in heaven going, okay, oh, okay, we're, we're going to go that route. <laughs> My two-year-old, um, he'll, he'll be in the living room. And it's crazy to me how, like, I haven't met, I haven't got to the teenage years, um, and I'm really scared <laughs> to get there. Um, because I look at my two-year-old who's sitting in the living room, we shut the TV off, we say it's bedtime, and he literally runs from the living room all the way to his bedroom, which is hilarious because his steps really aren't that big, so it just kind of sounds like, 
and he's running, and he finally gets there, and he shuts the door, and he throws himself on the floor, and we can see him in the baby monitor, and he's going, just face down. And I look up at my wife, and I was like, I kind of wanted him to go to his room anyways. Like, is that bad? Like, I, I kind of wanted him that way anyways, but he did it in anger and, and upsetment. Like, I hate my life! Like, but we do that with God, and God's going, I really kind of wanted you on your knees anyway. That's cool. Like, I, I really kind of wanted you there in the first place. That's where I, where I really needed you. Contentment is an inward, peaceful frame of spirit, frame of mind. That means it's not just trying to tell yourself, calm down, just calm down. It's okay, your kid just smacked you in the face with a a frying pan. It's okay, just calm down, just calm down. It's okay, don't kill him, it's okay. No, that's not what contentment is. Like, don't kill your kid, like, that's not what I'm saying either. Um, But that's not what contentment is, is just sitting here and pretending like everything okay. There's a serenity, there's a peace, there's a calm that doesn't mean I have to say I like every situation. But what it does mean is in the midst of every situation, you're not the person that no one wants to be around because you're miserable. Again, you don't want to be that person that comes over and people are going, oh, go home, please. Kill my buzz, bro. No, like you can have any situation going on in life and, and you can not like it, but you can still come to your friends and go, yeah, I'm really wrestling with this situation. I really don't like it that much. But I know God's doing something pretty cool. I don't know what it is yet, <laughs> but I know he's doing something pretty cool. Paul says in verse 11, I'm content. Paul says in verse 12, I learned the secret how. In 13, he tells you where it comes from. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Where does the inner peace come from? Entirely from the agency of another. It doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from our circumstances. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It's not, and and man, I have seen this so many different times when people are running or people are on their bikes or doing triathlons or doing all this different stuff and they got, you know, on the back, Tim Tebow, you know, I can do all things through Christ strengthens me. I'm not saying that that's bad. But that's really not what this verse is saying. That's, Paul, Paul, Paul's not sitting there going, hey, jump off a bridge with Christ, you're good. That's not what he's saying. So don't answer, get jack slapped. Your mama looks at you and goes, you're going to jump off the bridge too? Oh, Jesus, I can do anything. Like, no, you're going to get backhanded. I'm just telling you, you're going to get backhanded. Don't do that. Now, some people read that. They quote it. They, they, they do all these different things. But what Paul is saying in context is not I can accomplish anything through God's strength. What he's saying is I can be at peace and content and a functional human being through God. With God, I can get through it. That's what he's saying. It's not I can, I can climb Mount Everest when I haven't done anything in the world to try. Let me promise you, I'm not climbing Mount Everest. And if I were to go up there and try doing it, going, Jesus is going to get me over it. I'm, I'm going to die, and I'm probably going to be calling up someone that can. I'm probably going to call up Jesse or, or, or Anthony and be like, hey, you guys got to come save me. I'm dying. Like, I can't make it. I remember a few years ago, um, I was actually with my, uh, my in-laws. We had gone up to a cabin up in Georgia, and we went hiking. And for everybody who knows me, I'm going to give you guys a good pause to laugh because I don't go hiking. That is not what Andrew does. He's not like, let Mr. go hike up the mountain. That's just not who I am. Um, And so we ended up going hiking. My wife wanted to see a waterfall that we never ended up seeing, but we we, we hiked about eight miles for it. Um, But anyways, so so we're on our way back, and it's it's raining now. Everyone is miserable. Like, literally everyone is miserable. We're all head to toe, covered in sweat, and all, Melissa, I love her to death. Melissa's just sitting there going, I just wanted to see a waterfall. I just wanted to see a waterfall. And and her her father is like... (gasps) And I'm behind him holding his back. <laughs> and we're about to die. And I slip and I dislocate my leg. I dislocate my ankle. And, and as a dude, my first thing is I jump up and I'm like, oh, I'm okay. I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I'm like that dude from uh, Monty Python, you know, no flesh wound, flesh wound, really flesh wound. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. No, and dude, why are, why are dudes this way? Like, man, what is wrong with us that we can't just stop and go, yeah, just dislocated my leg. I should probably sit down. 
maybe. <laughs> like, <laughs> I should take a break. Like, I don't know what it is about men, but sure enough, I jumped up, made it worse because I immediately put my pressure back on it, and my brother-in-law and my father-in-law had to drag me about a mile and a half back to our car, and then my brother-in-law ended up having to drive me back to the hospital. Some people have different internal and emotional crises. They say, no, it's fine. I'm just going to eat these emotions and stuff them down deep inside. And what happens is they will make you physically sick. There are literally people that sit in hospitals that are depressed to the point that their body physically is breaking down. They are physically breaking down. So if you want the full definition, Christian contentment is a peaceful inward frame of spirit that freely submits to and delights in union with the Almighty. I had a, a friend a few years ago um, that he's actually the reason that I started going to the church that I went to before here. Um, his name was Chris. And he went off to basic training. Um, and in basic training, he had a massive heart problem. And... Um, the, the doctors got to him, they didn't give him the right kind of medicine, um, and he ended up passing away. And I'll never forget getting the text message, hey, Chris, Chris is gone. I'll never forget it. And I remember thinking, God, why? Like, why? But do you know what stands out to me more than anything? We went to the memorial service, and um, his wife looks at me, and, and I remember looking at her and just being like, I... I don't understand. And I remember her saying, he wasn't ours. He was God's. He was never mine in the first place. If anybody had the right to be upset, it was her. If anybody had the right to look at God and say, no, this is not okay, it was her. But she actually started comforting people. She just lost her husband. She was pregnant and had a one and a half year old. And she's encouraging people? Why? Because she knew who was in control. She knew that God was the one that was overseeing everything. That her contentment wasn't in the situation. No, the situation sucked. But she wasn't focused on the situation. She wasn't focused on her circumstances. She was focused on the one who was in control of them. Amen? It just gets me every time, y'all. Ah, I remember um, at the memorial service, one of the soldiers that they do like the, the, the I don't remember what it's called, the, um, the shooting. 21 gun salute. They're, they're doing that. And I remember one of the soldiers look over and, and he goes, dude, um, I, I've been to a ton of these. They actually have a, a department of these guys just go and they do this. He said, I've never been to one that was happy. He goes, what is wrong with you people? How are you happy right now? This is not a happy time. And we were able to look at him and we were able to say it's not the building we're in, but it's about the one who we serve. We know that he is there. We know that he's keeping us content and he's keeping us safe. Hebrews 13 says, keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. For he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I think it's the craziest combination of verses. He doesn't say don't love money because money is evil and it's going to do evil things and all this different stuff. No, he says don't love money because God's never going to leave you. What do you need to love money for? He's got you. It's not, hey, I can't be rich, I can't have good money, I can't have wealth. That's not what God's saying. What he's saying is I'll never leave you. Don't worry about money. Don't worry about finances. Finances is probably one of the leading causes of suicide. It's one of the leading causes in depression. Finances. But, but it's because we, we're, we're so stuck in focusing on what we don't have that we don't just trust God with what we do have. I'm running out of time. Let me give you two quick ways to help with this. First is we need to pray, guys. We have to pray. We have to talk to our Heavenly Father about our situations. 
Samuel can come up to me and he can say, I fell, I'm hurt, I'm crying, I'm upset. Why? Because he knows I love him. I can pray and I can talk to my heavenly father. I can tell him I'm not happy with what's going on. It's okay. We don't have to feel like we can't talk to him. Samuel will come up to me and I'll go, Daddy, hold you. Can I hold you? And I'm sitting there going, yeah, you can't hold me, bro. <laughs> you can't hold me. We'll, we'll work the semantics out later. Um, but he comes up to me and he says that and I want you to hold me. Why does he do that? Why does he come up to me and say, hold, hold me, please? Because he knows I'm strong enough to. He knows I'm strong enough to hold him. God is strong enough to hold you. He's strong enough that no matter what life circumstance you're in, that you think he's left you. He's strong enough to hold you. So you pray and you cry out to God and you say, God, hold me, please. And then the second thing that we need to do, you need to preach to yourself. We have to preach to ourselves. We have to sit there and we talk to God and then we look at our problems and we say, let me tell you about my God. Let me tell you about how he's going to overcome all this. We talk to God and then we tell our problems about our God. The psalmist uh, sits there and, and he writes, um, he says, why, why are you downcast, O my soul? Hope in God. I love that. The psalmist is talking to himself, um, which makes me feel a little bit better when I talk to myself. Um, and, he, and he's looking to himself and he says, hey, hey, yo, why are you downcast? Hope in God. And that can, that can sound and look a lot of different ways. That can, that can look like, why are you downcast, O my soul? Like, come on, be peppy. That can sound like you're still in your pajamas, it's four o'clock in the afternoon, and all you've done all day is cry. Or for dudes, you're sitting in the deer stand, and you're miserable, and the only reason you can't be around your family, because frankly your wife's kicked you out because you're miserable, she doesn't want you in the room, and you're out there sitting by yourself, and you know God's wanting you to talk to him, and you're just sitting there going, no, I ain't gonna talk to him, I ain't gonna do that, I'm fine. We have to talk to God, and we have to tell our problems about our God. I'm going to go ahead, and I'm, I'm actually going to ask the, the worship team to go ahead and come on back up. Um, and um, one of the biggest struggles in my life um, has actually been contentment. Um, it's, it's not always easy to to sit and to look at life and to realize that it's not shaping up the way you thought it would be. I remember when I, I got called into ministry, um, I was working in construction. Uh, I was making almost six figures. I had anything and everything you could think of. I had a, a, a wife. I had a beautiful home. I had a child on the way. I had, I had plenty of money, but do you know I still was discontent? I remember people would come up and just be like, man, you got it all together. I'd be like, please don't open my front door. Please don't look in. Because you'll see that I'm miserable. You'll see that, that I, I'm not happy in any which way, shape, or form. I want to I wanna end, um, I want to end with a verse. Um, and, and, and it's in Matthew um, and it says, then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. <sighs> Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came back to the disciples who were with him and, and they were all asleep. He was by himself. Jesus Christ in his worst possible moment was by himself. They couldn't even stay awake. 
And he comes to his disciples and he found them sleeping and he said, Peter, could you not keep watch with me for an hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for a second time, he went away and he prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink, your will be done. Again, he came back and he found them all sleeping. And and scripture even kind of defends him a little bit. And he says, hey, their eyes are heavy. So leaving again alone, he goes away a third time. And he literally says the same words. He gets on his knees and he says, God, if there is a way for this to pass from me, I don't like the situation I'm in. If there's another way for this cup to pass, please let it pass. Our heavenly father, Jesus Christ is literally crying out to God going, if there's another way, please. So when someone looks at you and says, hey, it's not okay to not be happy with the situation you're in, you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Jesus Christ wasn't happy. But what did he do? He prayed to God and he preached to himself. He said, your will be done. God's will be done. Guys, the, the worship team is about to go into a song, um, and I'm, I'm going to ask the, the elders to come up. And I, I know this is a little bit different. I'm going to ask one of them to come stand up on this corner. I'm going to ask the other to come stand up over here. And I know that this is different than what probably everybody's done. We're going to take communion right now as well. Guys, if, if you're wrestling with contentment, if you're wrestling with something in your life, whether you do it at your seat, whether you come get prayer with one of the elders, I'm going to be standing down here too. Whether you just need to come up and pray. Whether you sit in your seat, wherever you're at, whatever is going on in your life, you can come to the altar. You can come to Jesus and say, God, I'm not strong enough to do this. And I challenge you right now, do not let pride stop you. Do not let pride get in the way and tell you that you can't come get prayer. That you can't let go of these things that are holding on to your life. Let's come to the altar. 